You are listening to Fanfa Tracks. Because of the following special program, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. Star Wars news in a single file. This is Making Tracks. Here are your hosts, Mark Newbold and Mark Lowcaster. That's not true. That's impossible. You're listening to Making Tracks and a very special episode from Five is From Weekend. This was back in December 2021 at Star Wars Family Fun Day and I had the great fortune to sit down with Neil Scanlon, Creature Effects Head on the Star Wars sequel trilogy, Rogue One and Solo, to talk about his amazing career. You'll be able to see video footage of this on Fanthatrax TV very soon. But for now, here on Making Tracks, this is myself chatting with Neil Scanlon. I feel like I should have arrived on a Segway. <laughs> what Warwick, Warwick Davis does, doesn't he? Uh... So how's life treating you before we get into the... Yeah, very well. Yeah, very well. We're, uh, we're, we're busy. We haven't really stopped. We were just chatting away that um, we locked down, as, as everybody did, for a short period of time. This is Lucasfilm. So uh, we went into a period where we stopped on Andor, which is uh, uh, the next uh, show that we worked on after we finished on the films. And um, but very quickly, uh, the industry is unbelievable, isn't it? It will come back. It fights. It doesn't uh, sit down for a minute. Yeah. So we, um, we 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 started back up to finish Andor, and now we're presently working in Wales, good old Wales, doing Willow, which is the next series of uh, shows they're doing, which is due to be concluded just before uh, just before the Christmas break. So so yeah, life goes on. It doesn't stop. Daft question because it's disrupted everybody, but how disruptive was it to the industry? I, in all honesty, it was. It, it didn't really disrupt us at all. I mean, there was that obvious period where, uh, you know, everybody was unsure, everybody was um, nervous and scared about what what the pandemic really meant to them. But the in, the industry itself was so quick to, I think, set in place protocols and and a kind of methodology of how it would deal with it. That um, yeah, it, it felt like a, a sort of you know, and I hope this is true for most people here. It, it felt like a sort of enforced break yeah. rather than, than anything other than that. And then we were right, you know, we came straight back into it. And, and as confidence has built, um, and the protocols have got tighter, or, or should I say better, it, it doesn't really, you know, it hasn't. They've been incredible at being able to do with that. So I mean, of course, those things cost huge amounts of money. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. There is always that advantage, yeah. Has there been anything that's come out of the back of that that, that that you would sort of see as an innovation that you think might make things better in terms of film production? Um, I think it's it, what's really interesting is that the pandemic has completely changed the film industry. I think what up until the point of, of lockdown, we were an industry that has, since time began, refined and, 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 and found a kind of way of working yeah. and an understanding of how we all work as, as, as this fractious group of people. And the idea of working away from home or the idea of, 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 of sort of making projects outside of, say, the cinema release system yeah. uh, hadn't really come into, in, into, into play. And during that lockdown period, I think the studios kind of reconsidered it completely. Yeah. And now we see, obviously, this enormous amount of work that's hit um, uh, the industry here in, 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 in the UK. And we've, we all have to, especially in my world, but I'm sure it's for every department, really had to consider what it's like to not have to be able to make, not able to make a phone call and just get 100 people to come and work with you. Yeah. Because those people are now all being used on different productions. So the industry has, has exploded and become a place that I have never experienced in my lifetime and probably the, the, the most vibrant and the most opportunist, opportunist time yeah. that I've ever known. So it, 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 something yeah, made everybody reconsider it right from the very, very top. I mean, I fear for cinema. Yeah. I wonder if, if, if cinema is going to suffer in the long term because so much of the, the shows that are being made now are being made 
um, you know, for um, uh, pay, you know, for yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, subscribe sub subscription TV. Um, but yeah, that's and that's you know. So to be honest, uh, uh, apart from some of the th those worrying aspects, it has been incredibly positive yeah. what's come out of it. And probably maybe it was due to happen at some point, but and, and this just happened. Yeah. Or maybe it was. It was a consequence of, of, of I mean, to be think people were watching things at home, weren't they, and yeah. enjoying them. Yeah. yeah. But it's interesting what you're saying, that Lucas said it years ago, that eventually going to the cinema would be like going to the opera, and it will be a dress-up event thing. Yeah. Maybe this is the time that that changeover happens? Yeah, I, 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 I agree. Yeah. Maybe that's what it is, yeah. It, it's, it's, I mean, I, I know when, you know, when I was younger, you know, it's quite way now. Um, <laughs> there, I used to think that cinema was, was was very clever because you would go to the ticket booth, wouldn't you? And ticket, but you would buy your ticket, and then you would walk up towards this sort of this opening stairway, the stairways to heaven. Yeah. And you'd walk up the stairs, and the doors would open. You'd walk in, and and uh, being brutally honest, last time I went to the cinema, it was it was it was so sterile. So, I mean, you just walked into this room that was completely. And there were ten cinemas, and you walked in, and it was a cold black room, yeah. and you sort of think, to some extent, we've, where's that? Where's that feeling that here's your here's your showcase film, yeah. and we're really going to show it to you in a way? So yeah, I think maybe that could also be a positive that yeah. cinema distributors and cinemas themselves, um, even even on the kind of mass level, really need to think about because the film is so precious and wonderful, isn't it? If yeah. you want it to be presented to you that way, yeah. it makes it different than watching it at home. Yeah, uh, I mean, you, you say that in the presentation, the magic of the presentation mm -hmm. of cinema, mm -hmm. and you yourself have been involved in the creation of that. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how that all be right to when you were a kid, what grabbed you, what sort of led you in? Okay, so, um, so I, I'm probably lucky or unlucky, depending on which way you want to look at it, which was, uh, and I remember when I was, I, I must have been about six years of age, my father had let me stay up late one night, late for me anyway, at six, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a film called Jason and the Argonauts, which was a Ray Harryhausen film, if anybody here remembers those films. And um, there is a sequence where Talos, this huge bronze statue, comes to life, and um, quite frankly, at that moment in time, people say this of them, but a light went on, yeah. and I knew at that point that's exactly what I wanted to do. And there was no negotiation, there was no lack of, of clarity. Yeah. Something switched itself on, and I became an absolute Harryhausen fanatic. I mean, I went to bed with Ray Harryhausen every night, yeah. um, and uh, you know, and pored over his books and pored over his work, and it completely encapsulated me and, and, and took me to a place and just motivated me. Yeah. Um, so really, from that moment on, I just, and in those days there was no internet, there was no way of finding how to do things. So you had to, one, use your own imagination, I suppose, and your own inventiveness, or pour through magazines, tiny magazines that, like Starlog or whatever, to find that little picture that was that next little bit of the jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that really just, that drove me to art, you know, that led me to art college in a sense, where I did a, a foundation and, a, a partial BA course. I never finished my Bachelor of Arts course because uh, I went to see a company called Cosgrove Hall, who were a stop motion company. That was my dream place to go yeah. work at the time. And I went to visit them and showed them my work, and they offered me a job. Um, I didn't tell them I was at college, I pretended I wasn't. And, um, and then uh, because they offered me that job, I had to make that choice. And so I decided that that was where my heart most lay. So, I went to join Cosgrove Hall. I spent a period of time working with Cosgrove Hall, a few years, about five years, I think, with Cosgrove. And it was wonderful, it was lovely. And then uh, I made a move, a lucky move, down to London where this whole new thing was sort of coming off the back of films like Grey Stokes and Crystal, yeah, yeah. which obviously Jim Henson and his team of people. Um, so this new thing called animatronics was happening. And so at uh, that time, animation was falling in, into the sort of shadows. Yeah. Animatronics was taken over, and so I found myself in that world and, and then just continued uh, in, and have continued in that environment ever since. Hi, this is Julie Dolan, the voice of Princess Leia, and you're listening to Fanthatrax. It's your only hope. Do you think if, if that Harry Harrison light, light bulb moment hadn't happened that you wouldn't have found this profession, or do you think somehow it was destined? No, I, I don't think I would have found this profession. I think... I, I think um, yeah, I think I, I'm, a, I'm a maker of things. I, n I never stop making things, and, and when I don't make things at work, which I no longer do very much, 
I still make things at home different, and, yeah. and, and my interest is obviously in the, 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 the real tangible world. The digital world is one that fascinates me, but I'm not sure if I'm wired the right way for that. Sure. But whether it would have led me into the film industry without Ray being there, I'm not sure. It happened so early that it kind of really did define who I was. So. Yeah. Kind of knew who I was at that point. Yeah. yeah, it's funny when you think of people like Harry Harrison in that time period. Like Willis O'Brien came before, and then Harry Harrison mm -hmm. was sort of his student. And there weren't that many. There weren't that many mega effects films. Yeah. There weren't that many geniuses like Harry Harrison. So yeah. it doesn't seem to be quite the same now because it's exploded in such a way. Yeah, I mean, he was he was he was an ex he was an exceptional human being. Yeah, and he was also a, a, he zealously guarded his techniques as well which and I see absolutely why he would so he was so therefore he was dominant I think during that period yeah. and, and and as such um, it created a, 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 a place of his own wasn't it a Harry, there was something about going to see a Harry Harrison film that no other film could do so it was an event yeah yeah, yeah. you mentioned animatronics obviously it's such a marriage of different disciplines and a lot of things come together to make it work and doing what you do you're a collaborative person because you've got to be did that was that a big attraction to what you were doing um, I think what happens is if you are uh, if you uh, yeah. there's a point in your life when you realize you can't do it all yeah. and uh, as much as you would wish to want to do it do it all you have to decide do you do you want to stay just just doing what you do or do you want to try and fulfill a larger ambition by working with other and, and, and working with other people? And so I think that that is just a natural progression in, 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 in uh, not necessarily natural progression, but one of the avenues that you can take along the line. And so what became a wonderful challenge for me was was when I worked with uh, the Jim Henson Creature Shop, and, uh, and unfortunately we had lost Jim several years before. That, that that we needed to embrace, I think, the whole bigger thing and and, and grow that company in somehow. And the only way of growing that company was to, to was literally to start to work. You know, on a, on a you know, take projects on, design them uh, in a sense along with the production team as to what you were going to try and do. How were you going to do that? And then, and then have people around you that you could train or, or work with. And you have to train some people who are brilliant anyway. Um, and so you kind of just naturally grow into that place. Really. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That must have been a very special time working at Henson, just because of yeah. the history. Of it, because everybody knows it. It's so beloved. Yeah, well, I think I think the thing about work, I, I am incredibly lucky, and I consider myself to be incredibly lucky because when I first got involved, I was paid to make mistakes. Right. So we were just a bunch of people who didn't know what we were doing. We had no idea of what we were doing. We, it was a technology that that was, you know, um, undefined, and we would make things, and they would break, and they would go wrong, and you know, and then we'd remake them, and uh, you know, that's what I think was ultimately. Uh, incredibly privileged. You see, in today, the pressure on so many people, on all of us, is to come into your respective industry or respective discipline and be really good at it right from the start. Yeah. And I think sometimes I have to check myself when I, ex my expectations of, of people coming into the industry, you know, I had that opportunity to do things that way. Yeah. And Jim was just the, the, the ultimate uh, mentor in that way. Yeah. I mean, you know, he was. He was, a, he was a, a, a wonderful, beautiful human being that loved what he did and really, I suppose to be fair, I was really honest, didn't really care how much money he spent doing it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so he was able to, you know, uh, he allowed these people, all of these people, so, so many of them went on to do so many other things in the industry. Yeah. Uh, when you look at uh, the, the kind of, you know, the people that passed through Jim's world that went on to do directing and producing as well as the stuff that we're yeah. more, more familiar with, the puppetry. So yes, it was it was a golden period. I think. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things yeah. you just said there was was I'm paraphrasing, but you, you almost have to fail to progress and move on. It's almost yeah. impo as important to get something wrong as it is to get it right the first time. You learn so much from it. Absolutely, fate. I mean, it's uh, you know good old Trish Bang Bang, isn't it? Up from the ashes grow the roses of success. So, <laughs> you know, there you go. Uh, yeah, you have to. You have to. Uh, you, you, I think to some extent you do. And I think what's but there is also a point where you have to, um, you have to, uh, well I think there's a point where what you do matures, you go through that and, and your, your knowledge or your wisdom or your experience tells you uh, when you might be, might be putting your foot wrong, you know, when there may be something where, and I think that's probably if anything, uh, what I have 
uh, uh, more more than most is that I'm quite old now. <laughs> <laughs> and that wisdom is what you learn over the years sure. because you have that chance. So, so it's 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 easier now, I think, to be able to guide to guide what we do and how we do it, uh, so that it is successful and we fail less for that sure. reason because yeah. we've had that chances to do those. But yeah, we mentioned the Harry Howes and light bulb moment in your line of work. Brian's in this, you know, similar realm as well. Is there a moment when you? When you think, I think I've got this, and I think this is this is going to progress, because there's always a point in any job when you think, I might not be doing this for the rest of my life, mm-hmm. this might not be my my mm-hmm. thing. Was there a moment when you thought, I think I've got this? No. You still, no. You still think? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I think that... Um, um, I think that... Uh, you, you, you gain confidence, yeah. and you gain experience, so you, you get better at what you do. Yeah. But I think, you know, for instance, if we take Force Awakens, when we, when we sort of came to do Force Awakens with JJ and Kathleen Kennedy, they had no real-world experience of animatronics at all. They, you know, Kathleen had more yeah. than JJ, and JJ had grown up through that, was a big fan of it, but actually was probably not very, hadn't been exposed to that many practical effects in the films that he was doing. And I think that when we, set out to do the things that we did you have that same that same you have you're trying to do something you you've done it before but you yeah. haven't done it before yeah. so you're never really quite sure whether it is going to work out you just have to have the confidence and the conviction and just to be honest the nerve yeah. and the trust in all the people that are working with you to do something and hope it will work yeah. if it does, and then if it doesn't then maybe experience tells you at a certain point to be able to change tack to draw it back to somewhere, but yeah. I don't think you ever get to that place where I don't. I haven't anyway. Where yeah. you think, oh, I'm nailed this. It's yeah. easy, you yeah. know, or, or this is it. Yes, there is an element of yes. We know what we can do, but um, I think always in the back of your mind, you're trying to push things a little bit harder. Yeah. So that puts you in a slightly unnervy place or yeah. a less comfortable place. Yeah. Yeah. When we spoke, obviously we spoke for Insider at length, mm-hmm. uh, and one of the things that, that sort of came out to, came out of that to me was. As years move on, technology progresses. In, but in other fields, it progresses as well. So now there's this nice marriage between the CG world, the practical world. People would assume the CG world has gone leaps and bounds, but your world has as well, to the point where it's not always a given which character will be one or the other. Yes. Um, stepping back briefly to, to Babe, obviously, which is the big Oscar win for yourself. How, how was the mixture on that one? Because CG technology then was fairly still bedding itself in. Your technology, I would imagine, for that particular show, was very bespoke, mm-hmm. very brutal sort of thing. What was the marriage like on that particular film? So I, I think with, with uh, a lot of the projects we've worked on, and Babe would be a good example of that, is that certainly at, uh, at the time where CG was much more in, in its infancy, yeah. um, well, the only way to get a pig to talk was to do a, an animatronic version of yeah. it, and hopefully that animatronic version would be convincingly enough uh, to the audience to, to believe that they're actually watching a real, a real pig talk. CG, it w- uh, in, in, at the time of Babe, it was possible for them to do it, but it was extremely labour-intensive, extremely long process, and extremely yeah. expensive. Yeah. Um, and there was also, I suppose, that middle ground doubt in George Miller's mind of whether or not you'd actually get the performance of the real animal enough to be able to do any form of, of kind of CG on top of yeah, it. Yeah, sure. So, so the premise was we should try to achieve everything practically, and where we can't achieve it practically, then we'll have, then we'll have to do CG because that's, the, that's our only other version. And as, as Babe was one of the first films, if probably the first film, where, where the animals were, ex, were designed as such to be able to talk with lips rather than just like, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. or as a narrative that Disney had done before, then it was imperative that you, know, you try to get as many shots practically because um, uh, the budget would have been undefined otherwise. Yeah, How yeah. would you define the budget? Yeah. You mentioned Force Awakens. There's some Star Wars fans in the room. Yeah, Maybe yeah, we'll yeah, talk yeah. about that. Uh, how early, how early doors were you, were you involved in that particular project? We were probably involved about um, about a year before, I suppose. Um, and um, we started uh, initially just with designs. So the idea was that JJ was in the States, we were here, 
Um, we knew that we, the film would be made in the UK at Pinewood, um, and Kathleen uh, and team, there was a, also a producer, Tommy Harper, who was involved, were really assembling a UK team of people and just testing the waters, I think. Yeah. Because one of the biggest things that, that, we, all, that we all are uh, responsible for, I think, in front of all people like yourselves and thousands and millions of other people as well, is what I call the sort of, you know, the heart of Star Wars yeah. and what Star Wars is. And uh, I w it would be unprofessional of me to mention any names, but I will. No. Um, uh, we ha there had been other people involved, and some of the designs, I think, had taken Star Wars away from the soul of Star Wars. Yeah. And I think that w one of the great things that we have here in the UK um, is, is, I think, we understand Star Wars very, very well. Uh, uh, I don't know, it seems to be more, it, it, it comes to us, I think. Maybe we're just closer to that real world that George wanted to hold on to. And so it was really, that was the most important thing, was to get to a place with JJ, the director, that he was confident that we were producing a um, faithful, world for, yeah. for him to be able to operate. He didn't want to throw away you know, everything and redesign it and take Star Wars in a whole, in his, you know, not his world, just in a whole different way. He wanted it to be as authentic and as, as heartfelt as he possibly could. And so, so certainly with our designs, production design, the worlds, all those things, costume, all those things, needed time to, uh, you know, to sort of get to that place. And he, want, he needed that journey with us. So it was, we did multiple designs of, of characters and, and creatures and aliens and things so that he could pour through those designs and begin to sort of do a kind of X factor selection process yeah. whereby that was the group that most, most felt that it was, it was hitting the right note for him. Yeah. Um, and and, and it was, that was also a kind of, a way of building a relationship with him and Kathy and, 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 and ultimately with Disney, but also as well, I think, um, allowing them the process to find themselves as well. Yeah. So they had that time too. So it was an, it was it, that first formative part was very much about getting to know Star Wars, I yeah. think, and getting to know each other yeah. creatively. It's an interesting yeah. point, though, that in the, in the most tactile, phys tactile physical sense, Star Wars is completely British. Yes. You know, yes. certainly the aesthetic, if not, yeah. you know, the rest of it. So. Yeah, yeah, but it to, is. To grow that, yeah. Yeah, 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 I agree. For everything in one location, daily news, reviews, interviews, podcasts, video and social media feeds, bookmark fanthatracks.com. For Star Wars News 24-7, 365. So what was the first creature you worked on Force Awakens? So the first one we really sort of, I think, was the, the Happer Ball, which is the, which, and, 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 and there's just a little, it's a fun thing really. If you, you imagine that you're a, you're, a, you're a producer and you make multi-million dollar films and you're a director like J.J. Abrams and then, you employ this group of people and you say to this producer, we've got this idea that we're going to build this creature and bring it to life and we're going to put sort of four people in it or six people in it. They're going to walk around and should we do some kind of prototype? It takes a huge, I think a huge leap of faith or yeah. stupidity, one or the other, to say yes to that. Uh, and it also takes a big leap of imagination to understand what the eventual thing will look like. And yeah. so, the Happer Boy is a good example of something that we built, which was really a really simple carnival creature. It was a series of different shapes. We had these four or five puppeteers inside it, each one in a leg and uh, one for the front and the back, I think, which makes sense. Um, and we mocked that up in very, very simple terms. Yeah. So very abstracted terms, really, to what the eventual creature would look like when we built it. But that was one of the first things that we sort of did. And I think that was a good... For me, that was also a good test for how much um, bandwidth they would give to us, right. and, and and where their comp, where, where they, their nerve might might uh, yeah. think. And concurrently, at the same time, with that BB-8, obviously, uh, and uh, it's occurring over there, uh, we began figuring out how we were going to do BB-8. Yeah. You know, and, um, and and so to me. There's, there's the crazy end, and if we can do that, and JJ can engage in something as abstract and as, 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 as yeah. mad as that, and then at the other end was that this incredibly precious, incredibly important, you know, uh, sort of uh, 
you know, the next R2-D2, sure. you know. Sure. So, um, yeah, we needed to figure out how to bring that to life. Yeah, because yeah. like you say, that there's confidence on all sides. So to pick something that's crazy, big, yeah. monster, you wouldn't fit it through that door, sort of crazy, and got the hopper ball. Yeah. And, and then right at the other end of the dial is something like BB-8, which yeah. is a droid, it's not a, yeah. you know, it, that, to land those two, to give them confidence in those two, must yeah. have given you all the latitude for everything in between. Yeah, and I think it, the other thing is is that there is a, a kind of, I suppose we all get this in our lives or whatever we do, but there's, there's, there is a sort of feeling that, um, that, that it's a bit like when someone comes to fix your boiler yeah. and you know they charge you £150 to fix the boiler and all they did was hit it with a hammer. <laughs> and then you go, what, it cost me 150 quid for that? And it's like, yeah, but it's, it's knowing where to hit it. <laughs> and you know, so you're paying for that. Yeah. Uh, and what you have to trust is the hammer solution was the best solution possible. <laughs> and you know, if you remember that Kathy or whatever had, had in her past been involved with, say, Jurassic Park, with, with you know, Stan Winston, and you're looking at some of the most phenomenally brilliant, but also complicated and hugely expensive things. Yeah. The T-Rex was masterful in, in all respects, yeah. but was also technologically right out on the edge of where they could be. And what we were suggesting was that we were going to completely throw all that out the window, and we were going to use uh, much more traditional, yeah. what we call mantronics, or should I call it now, peopletronics, yeah. <laughs> uh, as a way of bringing these things to life. And I think that can be sometimes... Uh, it's, sometimes it's easy to blind people with science and they feel like their, their, their money is being well spent because they can see it. Yeah. But when you suggest to someone, oh, the best way of bringing this to life is to put a person inside it or three people inside it or do it this way or that way, then I think that that is also something which you, you know, we had to tread tentatively with to see if they would, uh, you know, certainly JJ as a director would engage in that kind of a thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and sometimes the best option really is a bit of fishing wire. Yeah, I, I mean that has become absolutely our mantra across all the Star Wars films. I mean there are there are some beautifully, uh, there are some characters which are astoundingly sophisticated and, and technologically, uh, you know, uh, very very um, uh, clever and and, and, and and right on the edge of what we're capable of doing technologically. But the majority of the characters are brought to life yeah. using people like Brian, yeah. uh, you know, who 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 bring who bring real, real emotions to those characters because there is, no, there is very little filter between, between their, their actorial and performing skills and the creature that they're doing and, and that technology will always get in the way of that, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, that's why Jim was, was again, I, I, you know, that's why Kermit's Kermit. Yeah. So there's nothing between Kermit and Jim's hand or, you know, Yoda was Yoda. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The, the puppet sitting right there on you yeah. know, Frank's hand hasn't got the life, has it? The puppet. It's a performer that puts the life yeah, into absolutely. the. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it can be the most sophisticated, clever. You know, we can be as proud as we want it to be, of, and, and you know, you know, chuffed about how well we've made it. But unless it lives on screen, it has it's no value at all. It has no value. You know. Has there ever been a creature then that you've created or worked on as a team that you thought that feels like it's going to pop off the screen? And sometimes the camera just doesn't get it, or, or sometimes it just doesn't work. And conversely, is there ever been a creature when you thought, well, he'll be sitting at the back of the bar, and he's been brought right to the front? You, you've got to prepare everything as if it's the superstar character. You do, yeah, absolutely. You, you, I mean, it's slightly, it's slightly a problem, that, really, yeah. because um, every character that we, that we do, and we're trying to sort of attend to that, I think, on a more economic level, uh, we have to, uh, but what we tended to do over over the films certainly, and I include Rogue One, I include so in, in, in the films that that not just the the, the main trilogy, um, is that you would never know ultimately where a character is going to be used, and so you we would we would lavish it with the same level of of um, attention and. Um, and that can be that can be incredibly rewarding. It can also be on the reverse side disappointing yeah. because you know I often say, and I don't mean this to quite sound the way it is, but some of the best work we've done you'll never see right. because it doesn't make it to the screen. You know, not everything you do yeah. uh, always gets to that place of prominence uh, where where in a sense it's like, well, okay, that's there's the reward for everybody's efforts. Yeah, know? yeah. So it's tough. It's it's tough from that sense to keep to make sure that you keep the enthusiasm level up and you, you keep the commitment up. 
uh, it's a gamble. You know, you're, we're all playing a game of gamble. Yeah. And there are certain characters you know are going to be featured. Sure. Certainly, they're bankable, and you, you know, BB-8 or you know, Yoda or um, um, you know, Sabac Table, for instance, is a, a great example of where you we knew that those characters around the table were an integral part of yeah. the narrative. Yeah. They would definitely be filmed alongside um, the actors as, uh, uh, and would, would be as featured as the actors, yeah. whereas many other of them are just part of the Star Wars world. So, yeah. Because I suppose it, uh, ultimately it gets laid out to the director and he makes choices and yeah. then the editor might have a different opinion or whatever. It's, Absolutely, yeah. It's all yeah. fodder for that. Yeah, yeah. It's, and the mercy of the cut, as they always say, because yeah. you only have X amount of time to tell a movie. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. In terms of innovation, which is obviously a, a big part of what you do, <clears throat> just sketch it out from when you started in Force Awakens to when you finished in Rise of Skywalker. What was the leap? Because it felt like right, it felt like Force Awakens was a massive leap to get to where that was. Mm -hmm. But you're talking what four or five years before you get to the next, you know, to the final mm -hmm. part of that trilogy. Were there many innovations that made life easier? That gave you other options? I think I think technology moves ahead very slowly in little little nibs, you know, and it's really difficult to quantify it. Yeah. And it's a collective thing. So what happens is the team of people that work with us from um, the beginning right through to now. I've all of, I've been mostly hold that family together, sure. and I think on an individual level, each person has has grown in some way. Our understanding and, and our communication, our ability to be able to work alongside each other, has grown and come together. There are real points though, where, if, for instance, if you look at say Maz, um, you know, originally Maz was going to be a puppet in the first instance. Yeah. Finding the design for Maz was phenomenally difficult, and we really didn't get to that point until almost the very end of Force yeah. Awakens. Way too late to have done something in animatronics. But then, by the end of it, we were able to then create, you know, uh, 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 what uh, what I think is probably the best animatronic entity we've ever made. Yeah. And again, um, it, it is a real shame. There was huge. Uh, there's a lot of sequences that were shot with Maz. Um, uh, around the layer, the whole layer story uh, that don't make it to the end of the film. But I can say at least with conviction that when we shot that puppet, and I think JJ would back me up on this if he, if we hear, she was she, as as a, a practical effect, she was phenomenal, and and that was literally down to the control system. Uh, the, the engineering, the animatronics, the skin technology, the painting of the skin, the making of the eyeballs, all that stuff was, I think, poured into Maz. And, and I think everybody that contributed to it were, 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 were at the very, the very highest end, really. The other side is, does technology develop? I think it's, technology implies that it has to be something that we maybe don't understand or is new or we invented. I think what we did, though, develop was, was almost an, un, an, un, an unbreakable confidence, in, or certainly I had an, un, an unwaverable confidence in the people that I was working with to be able to do anything that I was asked of. So by, and I still do, but by the end of the trilogy, I would be able to sit in a meeting with, with a director, you know, with JJ or whoever, and they would say, well, you can do that, can't you? And my answer would just be yes. Yeah. Because I, we had really, uh, you know, so on Jurassic, it was, we, it was just, that's, that's technology in its own way. Yeah. The technology is, is, is a sum total, isn't it, of, of everybody's yeah. skills yeah, yeah. that create an entity at the end, not an individual advancement in an electric motor or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so yes, we, we had progressed to the point, I think, of almost complete confidence of, in, in, in what we wanted to try and do. Because it's yeah. part of that collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. And I yeah. suppose one innovation, one tweak, one adjustment absolutely. in the positive yeah. sense helps everything, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. And that's happening in the mould mold world, where the mould makers are making a mould and, and they fight, figure a new way, of, a slightly different approach. It, it tweaks your understanding. and. Kenny Wilson, who's our, the head of our mole shop, always coins this, this phrase to say it's a 40, 50 year apprenticeship. And I think that's really quite true, really. Which is what makes the job so fabulous for people, you know? Yeah. Because you're, you're, you're not ever, not ever uh, always repeating what you, you, you're always, they are also pushing and testing yeah. themselves, which is, which is what makes it engaging. Yeah. yeah. So given that attitude yourself, you never stop learning, well, nobody ever stops learning, but, but certainly in your trade, you never stop learning, learning. It must be delightful then when something comes along that you th thought five years ago, ah, we're never going to get to that, and all of a sudden somebody figures it out. And it yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it's, 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 
I mean, I'm so lucky because, in a sense, that you know, where where I where I I'm 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 uh, I people do these things, and I get to witness what they're doing. Sure. So I get the joy of the net result, yeah. you know. And then, you know, uh, I mean, I think it was just, we call him Six Eyes. I think he, 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 I'm terrible at remembering real proper Star Wars names, but if the, the character is Solo, um, I mean, you know, Gustav Ho Hosian that made the mechanism for that yeah. excelled. And Matt Denton, who is uh, 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 essentially our software stroke performance control um, uh, you know, head expert, whatever, I don't quite know how to define that. He's, he's an enormously um, intelligent human being. I mean, really, again, wrote, wrote a control software performance-based package that allowed that character to come to life. And, you know, I, I had no, until the last minute when it gets turned on, and then, you know, someone like Brian or whatever puts their hands in it and starts bringing it to life, then you suddenly see how, just how wonderful all these people's work is, how, yeah. how it's come together. And, it's astounding. Yeah. You know, it's, it's wow. That's you know, uh, it's beyond expectation. Sure. Which is, you know, and the most important element of all of that is the people, isn't it? The performance. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, the ability to be able to perform it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's um, yeah, and and performing performance is something which is not, is not defined either. It's an it, it's an inter it's it's a it's a collective it's an interactive thing between yeah. between what's happening in the moment, on the set, and um, therefore it needs to remain uh, organic and flexible yeah. in the yeah. same way, whereas, whereas performance can sometimes be defined in the Disney sense of the word in the theme parks as being pre-programmed or something that has, it's fixed. Yeah. Uh, uh, performance that we do for an animatronic is it happens in real time and it happens, uh, it's directable, it's being directed in the same as way well. as the actors are, yeah, yeah. 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 and that makes a that makes it very different, I think. Hi there, this is Mike Quinn. I played Nine Numb in Return of the Jedi and the new trilogy, and you're listening to Panther Tracks. Of the five projects that we're talking about, which one was the most overwhelming in the sense of there's a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of things to figure out? I mean, my head's telling me Canto Bite, but maybe it was something else. What, what was the one that you thought, wow, that's a chunk of work? Um, I, I suppose, to be honest, I, th I think I, I think Force Awakens still stands as that because because it was it was it was all of us coming together for the for for, for the first time, some of us, and doing something that was that was a, a, a group, a, a collective thing. We were also going to take this onto location. We were going to take it out of our, our comfort zone and out of our support zone. We were, we had every type of kind of puppet on that show, in a yeah. sense. Yeah. We were also a lead character, so the pressure on us to be able to consistently perform in a lead role, not just in a supportive role. So across the board, that I think that 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 film tested all of those things. So when we came to work with Ryan, yeah. then we were much more confident, of, I think, of what he was able to throw at us. So something like the Sea Cow, which seems on the surface to be much more difficult, flying it in on a helicopter yeah. into a location in Ireland and setting it all up, kind of does on paper. But in actual fact, it was more just a case of re going through the same experiences that we'd gone through by taking um, uh, you know, the, the characters. Uh, yeah. abroad on um, Force Awakens. Yeah. When we spoke before, you said that there's, there's a budget. Uh, it's not a fixed budget for a specific thing, but a budget. So when you mentioned the, the, the sea cow as an example, of when we spoke before, you said, well, why wouldn't we do it? Why wouldn't we do it? Why, why would you let away and do it if we can build it and make it mm -hmm. happen? So that must give you pride when you put it on that mountainside yeah. and anchor it down and all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, the true reality is, is that practical effects are still cheaper than digital effects, yeah. Yeah. whichever way you look at it. And, and so, you know, you, you can have an internal debate about whether you believe that, you know, how, why do practical effects, uh, why, do, why do people respond to practical effects? differently than they do to digital effects, which is better, which is whatever, which is generational. Is it just that I'm old and I like practical effects and I like digital effects, but if I was younger, I wouldn't? Yeah. I all of that is so, so thing, but on a pure budget economic level, 
um, it is it is always better to shoot something and get it in camera yeah. and have it there already on the negative than it is to go into a post-production scenario and have to generate it later I think and, and whether that will change as the years go on I'm not really quite sure yeah. I think when you look at digital and you look at the huge amount of work that they have to do in order to create a digital character it's not dissimilar to what we have to do to be honest they are building it from the bones up you know as we are so I you know and then they have to you know, animate it and composite it and do all those things that we don't have to worry about because we're there on the day. Yeah. So that expense is already taken care of. Yeah, because you've got the physical thing on set there. And yeah. Is there, has there been a character or a creature that you've you've seen performed or, or in show and tell or whatever, you know, test, that you've suddenly, wow, I, I didn't expect it to be able to do that. I didn't expect the performer to be able to make it do that. Something that really came alive in the moment that maybe you weren't quite expecting to be so impressive. I think, to be honest, though it didn't make it to the screen in, completely, in a completely practical sense, because ultimately it was, it was, it was modified with CG later, the, um, I'm going to call it the snake, because again, uh, I, uh, I suffer to remember what the, the real name was. It Brian probably knows what it is. I don't remember. But, um, <laughs> the Vexus. The Vexus, yeah, was a, was a puppet that we built that was essentially based on a piece of, of extract hose. <coughs> Um, the idea of getting a big piece of extract hose that was big enough for people to climb in it, yeah. and Brian climbed in it at one point, and uh, crawl around inside it and bring it to life by physically rolling around and then having this thing on a pole arm. You know, on paper, it just sounds like the crudest entity on the planet. But actually, when we shot that in, inside the cavern and with Daisy and, and JJ and everybody else, it was, it was amazing. And uh, it had power, it had presence, it had weight, it had everything that one would hope to, to do practically, yeah. yet it was the simplest, cheapest version of something that you could ever imagine. Yeah. And, and that, that was, was, was a surprise, yeah. uh, a good surprise, because yeah. obviously we gambled on that. But I was surprised at just how well how well that worked, and yeah. and and it would have been it's a shame that in a sense we had to or they you know that it was necessary to do some CG uh, recoloration because sometimes I think it often feels like maybe you know our contribution was a little lost. But personally, I don't feel that yeah. it existed very much in that world, and the people responsible for performing and building it, their work was still very much on screen and. Yeah. And for that, I, you know, it's still, I'm, still I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of that character yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for what everybody did. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's a marriage between practical and digital, uh, certain things that, like you, that's a great example, obviously, that I then will then come in or whichever effects house and, and enhance yeah. things. Yeah. That, is that something when you go into a scenario, you, you sometimes, you've got to be prepared to expect that to happen? And is yeah. there no ego? Well, it's no ego. It's not whatever is the best thing on screen at the end is, is the best result in the end. I think if you went back twenty years, there was huge egos involved, mine included. I yeah. mean, and when you're running your own company, and then there's this new technology that comes along, it's a threat. Yeah. And your natural commercial instincts is to to be competitive in, in any sense of the word. And when you're winning a contract, or you're you, and, and, and you're, in a sense your your overhead, etc., all that sort of stuff. So I think what happened was when digital emerged as being a really a really viable proposition, there was there was generally competitive not not only within the digital world but certainly between digital and practical, and yeah. that's not just ourselves. That's special effects. That's construction. Yeah. That's all the areas that digital would affect. And I think for ten years or maybe longer than that, that's exactly what it was. But then I think what happened is what happens is that it settles down after a while. And I suppose that it separates the, is it the wheat from the chaff and the strong contenders, the yeah. wettest of the world, the ILMs of the world, you know, uh, get to a place where they're less insecure about who they are. Therefore, you start to look at what you're doing as a visual effect again. Yeah. And as we all come from the same place in our souls, yeah. then you start to think, how is the best way of doing this? And when you're working on a film that is ultimately being paid for by one company, so therefore it doesn't really help you to be any more competitive. If yeah. you're, we essentially are employed by Disney, so are the, so are ILM, but yeah. I'm owned by Disney, yeah. so am I. Um, <laughs> and uh, so therefore that removes that as well. So yeah. you, there's no commercial competition, now it's purely creative. And I still personally don't believe that we have done enough and, and, and has not yet been the perfect combination of practical digital effects. Right. I would love 
But I still think there's a huge, there's a really amazing, there's some amazing stuff to come yeah. if the opportunity was ever allowed to be able to really do both. Not, and that's the problem is it's not because you need to, you have to do it because you want to, right. because you don't need to do it. Yeah. Because digital does it brilliantly, practical does it brilliantly, yeah. you can enhance one a little bit or whatever, but actually there's also that desire to say, I don't, we, let's throw that aside yeah. and let's just do something that is, this because we want to do it and we want to do it. And, and, and you know, we've, we try yeah. and I, I'm sure there will be a point where a character will come along where it's almost like, the only way to do this is actually just join forces on an almost 50-50 level. Yeah. And, um, and, and it's a little bit like Go Motion when yeah. Go Motion came yeah. along and animators were then being driven by servo motors yeah. and there was a kind of marriage between the technology that was emerging and the traditional an animation that was there. You yeah. know, we get Dragon Slayer, which yeah. is stunning. Yeah. Really. Yeah. 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 Are there any creatures that have been put on screen in the past when you still look? I mean, you're an insider, so you, you kind of know how these things work. But you still sometimes, well, you can lose yourself in the moment and go, how did they do that? Um, what I mean is, is sometimes it's the performance as much as I think the... If you, I think if you go back to things like, and it's a great Star Wars thing, really, if you go back to Metropolis and you look at the suit yeah. uh, uh, and you think, Oh, no, yeah, I do. I do think how uh, the, the materials, the understanding, the artistry, all of that is just mind blowing, isn't it? And when you look about, you know, the creature from the Black Lagoon suit and the creature from the Black Lagoon suit, and you look at again the materials they had. So, if, you know, I think unfortunately after that time, I kind of know how they did it. Yeah. So yeah. I still marvel at it. Don't sure. get me wrong. And there's many, many things I could do as examples of of, of, of other people's works, which are just are stunning and I'm an absolute sort of in awe of but I think prior to those there are certain things that you look back on and think for their day even Frankenstein the yeah. makeups of Frankenstein and Boris Karloff and those things for their day I look at those and, and still think how on earth did they do that in that day yeah. materials were you know they were using materials that we think we still use today yeah and um, I'm using them amazingly well you know yeah so yeah I think it's that it's that point in which I don't really, I suppose it's a time, an era which I can't relate to because it's an era earlier than me, sure. and then I look at something and you look at those things and think, those artists, I mean, the Wizard of Oz, yeah. you know, the Lion, the Tin Man, those sort of characters are just, just exquisite designs, yeah. brilliantly executed and stunningly performed. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Oh, you say Wizard of Oz, I think yeah. when the witch turns, yeah. that, yeah. that effect. The squid in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, yeah. the Disney version, is still a, an incredibly effective very very large you know, yeah. semi what we call animatronic entity yeah, yeah. it works so yeah. brilliantly well doesn't it within the scene yeah you mentioned earlier obviously you're working on willow at the moment and it, and it strikes me now you mentioned uh, television versus cinema versus streaming and all the other th considerations we're kind of approaching that perfect storm of cg and, and mm -hmm. animatronics being very much considered on the same artistic you know you know what i'm saying that the same level so you've got options and such how different is it for you going from working for Lucasfilm on big screen stuff to now working for Lucasfilm on small screen stuff, or is there really no difference at all? Is it very much a similar thing? It's essentially the same thing. I mean, I think that that um, yeah, you can't drop you can't drop the quality. No. You can't change the brand, and it's therefore, it's, I think it's everybody's responsibility to maintain that across the series. Yeah, uh, it is much more demanding. There, there is there is less predictability. There is, it's it. I think we're young in how to do that, and um, and again, it's all right. It's much better when you're a cosy group of people that happen to have done two films together. Yeah. Now we're much more groups of people that are thrown together from different walks of life. Right. Um, who haven't who necessarily? Some people have never been involved with a Star Wars project, and a lot of them haven't. So those, those, those things are much more demanding and they take a lot more, it, it takes a lot more, I think, to, to keep, to keep the, the process moving efficiently. But actually, at the, at, the, at the end result has to be the yeah. same. And so therefore, in so many ways, our processes are the same. Yeah. It, it's, I think, 
cumulatively making everything to get it on the screen well, hasn't really changed. Sure. However, we're having to relearn, and I think everybody would agree with this too, that's involved. We're having to learn right across the board how to get that onto the screen under the, under a different kind of time pressure, yeah. under a different kind of, you know, the, the dynamics are different. We're not as we're not we're not as well versed in it as we once were. Uh, uh, not as well versed in it yet as we are in film. Sure. Yeah. Sure. It's going to take a time. Yeah. I mean, he said about so many more shows now, so many more companies and streaming and things, yeah. and those talented people that you had as a team, let's say, on those five movies now yeah. move on because that's the yeah. way life goes yeah. and new people come in. Yeah. And going back to something he said earlier about how you kind of know when it feels right, mm -hmm. when it's Star Wars, mm -hmm. there's that aesthetic and that mm -hmm. heft and that feel to it. Is that a challenge? Many of your team will get it and know that, but is that a challenge conveying that to somebody who's got all the skills in the world but doesn't quite get that Star Wars aesthetic, for example, or Willow? Yeah, I think what's I've come to the conclusion with, and it's it's quite quite recent, really, in my mind, a bit of soul searching, I suppose, is that is you know I mentioned that when I had my little eureka moment, and I think you know we're all guilty of looking back on your own life with a certain amount of kind of self gratification, and I was this and I was that, and you kind of expect you you deep down it would only be truthful and honest with me to say that I what I want to do is to have people walk through the door that are like me. And when I realise, actually, there isn't anyone going to walk through the door like me because I'm just some old fuddy-duddy that did stuff a certain way. Sure. In fact, the problem is, is that I'm looking for people that will walk through the door that can do what I do. And I should be looking for people who can walk through the door. I should be changing my, tech, my attitude, gotcha. my, uh, how I'm going to do things to accommodate people, younger generations and, and artists of today using the tech, <coughs> techniques that they're good at. Right. So it's a really interesting thing that, you know, we, we have, as I say, all, I think we're about to go through another yeah, phase, yeah. which is to reinvent on a fundamental level how we make things and do things. Yeah. And, um, what technologies we use. I mean, for instance, we recently did a job where, in, in our world, we would sculpt something in clay, yeah. we would mould it in fibreglass, we would produce it in foam, we would do this and do that. We just did a job where nothing at all was done in any of those departments. It was all done digitally and farmed out to different companies. Right. So the mould was printed using printed pre 3D technology. So we sculpted it in said brush. We... we uh, uh, sort of skinned it in ZBrush, yeah. we built the mechanics inside SolidWorks, the mould went off and was printed and came back as a negative, um, the, the skull and all those bits were printed as positives, the parts were all machined on machining centres and came back and were put together like an Apano kit, yeah, yeah. Um, and then obviously we did pour the skin and, and things, but what was really engaging about that or interesting about that is that there are lots of people who are learning at college today who know how to do all those things. Right. They don't need to know what I was doing with Jim Henson all those years ago or how we did it so many years ago because they know how to do it that way. Right. It's me that needs to be able to accommodate and change and bring them that new generation. That's where the future of what we do lies, not in taking the craft forward. Right. It's redefining the craft and taking it forward. Keeping an eye on what the soul of it looks like and keeping an eye on what the heart is, that's really fundamental, yeah. That's at the very fundamental start of the design yeah. and how you might perform it later and how you might bring it to life and what, what, what fits within, within a Star Wars rather than, say, a Marvel world. Yeah. But I think I'm sort of, I've hijacked your, your question a little Not bit so. because it's, it is a little bit that, yeah, I think that that's, that's, that's to me something that's really... It's not like the penny's just dropped, but I think it's, it's really... A, 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 a fundamental yeah. change in, in and that comes from uh, that question of not not just being able to always put lots of people on by solving a problem by using lots of workforce yes. is one way of doing it and the other way is essentially is to re, is to literally look around you and kind of right let's embrace all of this yeah. and, and redefine how we do things so that we can do things Unfortunately, with less people, yeah. the fortunate side is there's more work for people anyway, so yeah. no one gets to no one gets to lose out. So maybe at this point of your career, then you're you're imparting a wisdom that you might not have expected to pass on because yeah. maybe you thought it was a more tangible hands-on yeah. thing. But but well, from what you just said, it's almost like get out your own way, Neil, yeah. and and do absolutely. something different. You're yeah. absolutely right. I honestly feel it's my responsibility to redefine how we do things before I and then pass the baton on. Yeah, that's you know not to walk away from an industry and, and let that knowledge fall away, but to, re, to, to 
to take that knowledge and take that experience and take all of what we have and package it and present it in a way that today, the young of today, the, the artists of today, can take hold of it and take it forward. That's the baton that we have to hand to them, yeah. not the old rusty baton. It has to be a new shiny one, one yeah. they understand, you yeah. know. And it needs to be shaped in such a way that they can take it forward. Um, because as we said, we'll never get that opportunity to do what we did and do things wrong and, 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 and develop over those years. Um, yeah, it's, I, I think that's a really important... Yeah. I think that's probably true across the whole, the whole discipline of, yeah. of, of, of the art departments and, and costume and all of those places where, yeah, yeah. And of COVID as well to some extent. Yeah. The whole thing of working, people needing or more rely, more people working from home now and, yeah. and working with their own environment, still being effective in the workplace. Yeah. It's all a big change, isn't it? Mm. I'm Brian Herring, BB8 puppeteer, and you're listening to Fan the Tracks. That'll learn you. Within the Star Wars galaxy and the work that you've, that you've done, what's the proudest moment? It doesn't have to be a creature, it doesn't have to be a Yoda. What's the proudest moment. Yoda. Yeah. yeah. And, and when I say it's, I'm proud of it, I'm proud of it because, because um, I mean, BB8 is, is, you know, I mean, I'm very, very proud of yeah. BB8. Yeah. Proud's not the one. Proud, probably BB8, to be honest, yeah. because I think that, 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 that with the help of people like Brian and Dave and, and Matt and Josh and, and Giles and all these people that put it together, the team that put it together, yeah. I mean, I, I, the design was JJ's. I attribute that absolutely whatever. But I think the ability to, you know, to actually bring him to life and, and have him have him live in that real world in yeah. the way that we did, yeah. I think is is really sums up what we do. Yeah. And I'm very proud of that. Was proud from the point of a different perspective. Was I was just proud that we were able to sort of, you know, uh, one of my most pleased with or most chuffed is a better word is getting to work with Frank Oz. Here I am watching Star Wars, you know, you know, I'm a kid too, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, all this stuff. Yeah. And although I'd worked with Frank previously on a, a different project, it wasn't the same thing as working with Frank doing Yoda. I mean, that to me was, I'm the child yeah. in that moment. And I think, you know, it's, um, and that was very true, I think, of, of when we were on set. I remember we were on set, we're in a, 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 an outside location, it's freezing cold at night, we're high up on a ridge. It's four in the morning or some of the same time because we're shooting at night. I remember looking down that way, down the hillside, and there must have been 30 to 50 people all just stood there. Yeah. It was totally silent. And every single one of them was that child for a moment again. And all they could hear was Yoda and see Yoda. And I just thought that's the magic of, yeah. of really, you know, that's it, sums it all up for me. So, so yeah. BB-8, I think, is, 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 is really... Uh, among so many... Uh, you, well, those questions are really cool. Oh, yeah. They? It's such a mean question. <laughs> I know. Uh, who's your favourite child? Exactly. Um, <laughs> you can't win, can you? Um, but, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Super. And now we awkwardly exit the stage as if you've all gone home. <laughs> Has anybody got a question? You can have a question if you oh, want. If you're happy to take a few questions. Absolutely. Ah, it's just like, so obviously within your Star Wars work, the context of that, was there any, ever a time when they said to you, like, create this or, or we want this to work like this and you thought, nah, it's just, I can't, it's impossible. Or, you know, it was, it was the most challenging thing you had to do, sort of thing. Um, I think what, what tends to happen is you, you not in Star Wars, pro, pro, previous when you're in maybe, should I say, less, less uh, experienced environments, that happen, would happen quite a lot, you yeah. know, that someone would say, oh, we need to do this and you, you, you do it as an animatronic and you kind of, there's no way you're going to pull that off, you know, it's, it's, I mean, and a good example of that is, a, is, a, is an example is we did a film called Kangaroo Jack. And you know the kind of you know halfway through that film we were building a kangaroo that was like hyper realistic, and then halfway through the film uh, Scooby Doo came out, and uh, Jerry Bruckheimer saw Scooby Doo and was like, "That's what we want. That's what." We... And you and you're like, "There is no way in the world we are ever going to pull this off. It's not going to happen." And yet the expectation was there. So at that point you are in a kind of sticky hole really because you just you know that they, you just can't compete with that. 
it was just, you know, he was a cartoon madness, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. But on Star Wars, because I think of the directors that we've worked with, and I think, again, Kathy's experience in that, show, that whole genre with Stephen and, 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 and um, E.T., etc., they're quite, they're quite smart, you know. I think everything is designed to a point, and, and if you can't... There's nothing that we've ever been pro- proposed with where... I mean, Snoke is a good example where you could say, couldn't we do an eight-foot-plus tall character, fully animatronic with extended limbs so that we don't have to think about using a performer, etc.? And maybe in a more foolish time, one would have said we could, but now it's just, no, it's, it's, it's you know, I think sensibilities kick in. Really? There's a few things we've done which have been hair, you know, kind of hair raising, where I remember on um, uh, Rogue there was a Paul Gullet, which you see, unfortunately, very, very little of. Um, but um, uh, in his, when Gareth was talking about, we built it and, and got it onto the set. It had this enormous uh, sort of, uh, what's the right word, sort of biological tank that it sat in, which contained like, I don't know, something insane like eight tonnes of water. I mean, it was a bomb ready to go off. And they were puppeteers, us, 20 puppeteers underneath it. And at any one point, you know, in that scene in Tower Inferno when the tank's blowing. <laughs> so we've pushed it a bit sometimes and you know you sit there thinking oh glad we got through that so and filling it up was kind of you know it was kind of it was a little bit that way as was making the mold where you're pouring you know i don't know two two tons of silicon all in one go which is like i don't know a thousand pound a pound or something ridiculous so so yeah yeah has been a bit yeah 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 thank you yeah no worries <laughs> It's really interesting hearing you speak, Neil, about like, the next generation and how you're sort of like preparing for that. I think the franchise as a whole at the moment is starting to think about those big questions about how it moves forward. Mm. When you talk about the heart of Star Wars and, and what it means to be Star Wars, how do you think it moves forward? How do, where do you think it goes next in, in terms of pushing the boundaries but still being recognisable as Star Wars? Mm. I think at the heart of the, 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 the difference... The thing that defined, I think, Star Wars at, from any other science fiction genre of its time, and I know this is probably me repeating what many others have said, probably, uh, although I'll pretend it's me, um, is, is that it, you never feel, you never really feel that you're outside of a world that it, we can't relate to. You, 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 it, you know, if you look at 2001, at that time, it was a science fiction, piece of science fiction genius, wasn't it? But we couldn't really relate to that at all. If you think Apollo was about the closest thing that we could get to, so having a computer talk to you and blah, 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 blah. And some of the more science fiction ones, again, were very, very otherworldly. So Star Wars at its heart makes you feel like it's familiar to you. So I think that's its, that's its fundamental anchor, that, that it never is so estranged or so... Um, so fantasy or fantastical that it loses grasp back to our real our real t- the real emotion or the real things that we hold that we that we understand mm-hmm. so i think if you take a creature for instance we have to be very careful that that creature doesn't have real to some extent if you if you take a, a porg for instance and i know i've chucked a really easy one in there but I, I don't think it's that difficult to think that you could wake up one morning and a pork would be sat in your tree because it's not that far removed from some of the fantastic things that live on this planet already and I think that's true of a lot of the things that we try to do and I think it's a lot of the things that the set designers try to do etc but a character that's got 48 arms and 14 legs and, and whatever somehow doesn't, do, doesn't work with the DNA that we understand the biological bubble that we, that we are as human beings suddenly is outside of the Star Wars world and I think so, so in its visual and its, its place that it lives in it all, it, it, we, you can never let go of that because then you've gone somewhere else and I, I do think that, that and this is a criticism maybe this, to me the fundamental mythology of Star Wars the fundamental hook to Star Wars was the whole you know Luke, Darth Vader, the, the, the Force. There was, it's like Lord of the Rings and the Ring, isn't it? And, and, and that. that mythology 
has to be held on to. There has to be a strong method, m- m- mythology to keep it to keep it different, to keep it. And then that's if you can take that those two things with you, I think you're going to hold, you will hold on to what George, what George gave everybody when we all went to see Star Wars and we watched the Star Wars films thereafter. That's outside of that. You can, I think you can push and you can go in new places and you can bring, you can change it, you can redesign it, you can do all those things. But at its heart, it must have those, it must have those things. It's like you know. Where does Bond go next in order to still remain Bond? You know, has Bond just become too old, outmoded, to be able to ha- to keep the ingredients that make a Bond a Bond? Bond will still always be great, but will it still be Bond if you don't have a certain amount of chauvinism and a certain amount of of kind of you know male testosterone driven this and that? I don't really know. It, 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 it's difficult. The, 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 you know, it's a bit like Carry On films, isn't it? You know, they are. But I don't think Star Wars is stuck like that. I think Star Wars is much freer than they are mm. uh, and, and able to, to go to somewhere. So that would be my thing. Be anyway. to ask. Well, as humble as it is, that's, that, that's my feeling. You know, that, that's what I look, look, look to hold on to. Um, is it, yeah, the, 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 there's, there's that. That was the thing that kept you sitting in the background, isn't it? It's that, that's the thing that's sort of... You know, waiting to, when you found out, you know, the big shots of the, the originals and, and those things, and yeah, that's the. Because I think in in every other way, the the audience and t- today's audience are 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 very willing, I think, to allow stories to go. I mean, I know that a lot of us hold on to the to the kind of the films that we hold really close to our hearts and preciously protect it but I think it is you know to the younger generation I'm sure I mean the prequels are loved absolutely loved I mean they're criticized by my generation because they're not the same as the first ones but to so many so many generations came after you know and I don't really criticize them they were I was just I'd grown up in that interim time and 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 and, and you know I think you know in many ways George was criticized at that time unfairly really because he was criticised by an audience which was so intolerant to allowing him to do something <laughs> but the younger audience that went to see them loved them because I think fundamentally they do still hold on to that and, and, and so that's what we need to do I think you know. it's, it's all down to the script isn't it at the end of the day it's that story it's, it's finding and having the confidence to, to write that story forward and then the responsibility of everybody involved to make it feel like you're still in that same you, you've still got your yeah your your, your visual finger on the pulse pleasure to talk to you all brilliant, brilliant. Thanks, again. thanks for listening to this very special episode of making tracks if you want to be a part of the action and stay updated on all the latest Star Wars news visit fanthetracks.com or check out the free Fanta Tracks app through the app store to follow us on your mobile device you can reach out to us and send in all listeners questions by emailing radio at fanthetracks.com please send them in we will literally answer anything and everything comment like and share on any of our social media feeds at fanthetracks and be sure to subscribe leave a review preferably a five star one on Amazon Music Audible Apple Podcasts Google Google Podcast, Spotify, or your podcatcher or smart speaker of choice. And as always, thanks to James Hempel for composing the Fanta Tracks intro, Adam O'Brien for our making tracks, opening music, and Mark Daniel and Vanessa Marshall for our voiceovers. Remember, tune in to our Fanta Tracks new show, Good Morning Tatooine, live most Sunday evenings at 9 o'clock UK, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific, on Facebook and YouTube. And that's me done for this episode, and we'll see you soon. Coming up next on Fanta Tracks Radio, it's another episode of making tracks.